Awesome. Welcome. Thanks for being here, attending this talk. I'm very happy about the attendance. My name is Helga. Um, I'm with a company called Offersen. Offersen is a usually known as the place you go to find a, a dev job. Um, but actually, we're a lot, lot more than that. The um, motto of, of, of Fasan is that talent is universally distributed, but opportunity is not. Uh, a lot of people, very talented people, kind of stuck in, in jobs that, where they're not really that inspired or get to contribute a lot. Um, and we're kind of trying to, to change that. And number one, item on, on that list is to create a marketplace where um, you can find awesome jobs and companies can, can find awesome, awesome developers, although we now also have opportunities for data scientists and designers as well as project managers. So it's basically anyone that's involved with building software. Other things we do, we also have something called Offers and Source, which is a blog platform where you can write your own blog post and get it published and read by a lot of people. So if you attended some nice talks of PyCon or maybe you gave a talk and you felt inspired by it, you can go and write a blog post, post for source. Um, and we also have something we call Offers and Make. We call it a make day, so it's one day you'll basically uh, put in leave and the idea be to attend, yeah. And the idea behind it is that we don't get to learn new things on our job because we're so busy doing the things we have to do for our job. So if you want to learn something new, if you want to learn about augmented reality or uh, data science or deep learning or anything like that, uh, it's not really an opportunity to do that. So this is kind of a day for doing just that. It's quite unstructured, although we do have just to make sure you're succeeding in what you want to achieve, there is a little bit of structure, but you're kind of free to go in any direction you want. Well, we currently have one make space in, in gardens in Cape Town, and there's also one actually in Rosebank in Johannesburg. Um, and that's really a, a super cool experience. Right, so that's, that's all I'm going to say about Offersen. So why am I giving this, this talk today? And just tying in with the company name, I usually like to pull out this book. It's called Sen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. <coughs> Who has read this book? Okay, quite a few people. Um, it's one of my favorite books. And it's not really about motorcycle maintenance, or Sen for that matter. To me, it's actually a book about passion for a thing you love about your craft, which in most of our cases would be software. And uh, it's important when you uh, have a craft like that to keep up with the tools. Um, and one of those tools that are becoming very important is that of data science, that of being able to use data within a product, product. So the purpose of this talk is to convey to you that uh, we feel that more developers should start doing more data science. When I submitted this talk, they wanted me to put it in the PyData track. And I said, no, I would just be sitting there preaching to the choir. Uh, I want everybody to actually start using these tools. And I want to share with you or show you that that <coughs> might actually be possible and a little bit how, about how to do it. Another reason why I think this, this is a good idea is that Developers also tick a lot of the boxes that we need in data science. So this is called the um, CRISP-DM data modeling, cross-industry process for data modeling or data mining. Um, and it kind of starts with your having a business understanding. Um, what problem are you actually trying to solve for the business you are in? Understanding about the data. Um, how to prepare that data, how to model that data, and finally how to evaluate your solution, and then deployment. And developers already tick a lot of these boxes, so they already have 
are quite trusted and, and important in the companies they are and they have a good understanding of how the business works, especially given that most companies are going more and more digital. They have a very good understanding of the data. Usually they wrote the code that generates the data and they know how to deploy systems in production. So I'm going to talk mostly about how to prepare your data today, how to model your data and how to evaluate if, if your data science model is doing what we want, want it to do. So for that purpose, I'm going to use this example. It's an example problem, but it's quite an important one. It's called named entity recognition. And the problem is, if you have any piece of text, you want to find these things called named entities. These can be names of people or names of places. Um, names of companies and various organizations. Uh, it can be things like times. Um, and I want you to just maybe think a little bit uh, about it just now. Like how would you go about solving this problem if you were faced, faced with such a problem? Like what would you, how would you try and code it? Any ideas? <laughs> oh, okay. okay, so that's a good one. Um, but what if you have something like um, this? It starts with Apple. So if this is the company Apple, we're talking about here, then we should recognize it as a named entity. But if you're talking about the fruit, it's a common word. <laughs> okay, more ideas? Yeah? Okay. Okay, so what she's talking about is part of, part of speech tagging. Uh, it's also something I've got um, in here. So the idea is that you uh, classify Bob as a noun, where's the ver verb, um, adverbs, things like that. Most of the time, the things we are interested in are going to be likely to be nouns. Um, this is also a challenging problem in itself, but there are, are pretty good tools to do this. Um, but it's not always about, about part of speech. Uh, if that was the case, um, this problem would be easy. But we also want to say, what, what is the named entity? Is it an organization? Is it a person? Uh, is it a <laughs> not fruits? We're not interested in fruits. Uh, but this is, this is one of the things that are usually go into these named, named entity recognition systems. That's, that's very true. Other ideas? Is there a finite set of, like, do you have all the <laughs> names of all the places, all the people in the world in a, in a dictionary that you can look up? Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Okay. <laughs> but there's still ambiguities, right? Uh, um, I mean, this is one that I made up, but it's, let's say somebody vandalized Donald Trump's Wikipedia page. Uh, and it says, Donald Trump is a 45th president of the U United States. In his pastime, he enjoys eating meatloaf while listening to meatloaf. And the vandalizer was not really good because he, he didn't capitalize meatloaf, but he's a vandalizer, so he's... 
<laughs> How do you know the difference between, <laughs> between this, not a named entity, and a named entity? Uh, it's tricky here to use capitalization. It's tricky to use a uh, dictionary lookup. Uh, both are uh, nouns in this context. <coughs> uh, so just okay, so just a few more. So so there's another one. Tickets for PyCon Um uh, will be on sale at Quicket. So there's something called a rigid designator. If if you uh, thinking about this problem uh, according to the definitions used in linguistic the linguistics, then a named entity must be a rigid designator. So, meaning it's a, it's a thing that doesn't change. The PyCon Saturday isn't going to change. The best conference ever, right now it's, it's PyCon Saturday 2018, but maybe next year it's going to be PyCon 27, 2019, right? So, then that's, that's called a plastic designator. We don't consider those in linguistics as uh, as a named entity also. Uh, and what about but uh, what about something like this? Um, Xbox and Microsoft. So there's definitely uh, a pattern to be to be found here. Uh, like the words X and B probably don't occur next to each other. All that frequently in English, so that that could be a clue, right? Um, what about this, Pirates of the Caribbean? You could easily imagine something picking up. Oh, pirates! It's a it's a common noun. Caribbean, it's a place. Uh, but actually, here we're talking about the movie Pirates of the Caribbean. So how do you detect that? <laughs> okay, yeah. Cool, all right. Yeah, but how long do you make that? <laughs> I mean, maybe there's an article talking about pair pirates operating in the Caribbean. All right, so I think the point is clear. This is a pretty hard problem if you start, start doing it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, all right. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough problem, but it's, it's one for where we have actually a lot of data. And so we can maybe say, let's, let's not try and code it. <laughs> let's try and learn it. So that's, that's kind of the idea behind machine learning, that instead of doing something like this, if noun, if uh, starts with a capital letter, but only in this context, blah, 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 nested type of thing. We rather want something like this. Bunch of examples um, of sentences containing named entities uh, with the named entities labeled, and then we give it to the machine, and the machine must then figure out, hey, what do I need to do with this? That's the core ID. Um, behind machine learning. So f for the machine to be able to do this, it needs something called, called features. 
So features are things that we extract from the sentence that we think are important to, to solving this problem. So what is often used in general language modeling and for this problem also is, is the idea of n n-grams. So you can have n equal to 1, 2, 3, n equal to 1 is just a single word in the case of words, n equal to 2 it's two words, n equal to 3 we're dealing with three words. Um, and you can split your sentence up in, in three uh, in sort of sets of three like that. You can do the same thing with, with characters. So uh, single letters, two letters together, three letters together. And that could be pretty useful, say in our case, for instance in the case of Xbox, where we have that by grab XP, which is quite unusual, so that could be and maybe you trigger that this is probably not a, a common word. It's probably a named entity. We did speak about uh, part of speech tagging. That's another feature one can, one can use. Is the word a noun? Is the word a verb? That could influence your prediction that you're making about whether or not a specific word in the text is a named entity. We also want to be encoding features. Um, the computer doesn't really like uh, just the just free text. We want to structure it in some other way. And one common way is something called one-hot encoding. The idea is that you put um, basically a vector of the length of the number of words that you have and you put just, just a one in the place that indicating the word you're observing. So if we're seeing the word Rome here, we put a one in the first place. If we're seeing a, uh, the word Paris, we put a one in the second place, and so on. And in this way, you can basically encode any word. Uh. So what is the sort of core idea in machine learning. The, the, um, the basics of it, it is you have all this data. This data belongs to, to classes, so the different classes will be the different uh, types of named entities. One class could be person, one class could be uh, organization, one class could be a, um, a year, and so on. And you want to, based on the data that we're observing about, about this this word, we want to say something, is it belonging to the one class or the other? So once we have encoded our data, it could end up looking something like this. In this case, we have two classes, a red and a, a blue. And a very simple model could be just to draw a line between those, if they're separated like this, and say anything on the one side belongs to the one class, and anything on the other side belongs to the other class. And there's also one other thing we can, we can deduce from this, and that is the further you are from this line, the more unlikely you are to belong to the other class. So if there's any disambiguity, um, confusion, it's likely to be found here close to, the, close to this line. So we can assign a sort of a probability around what we think the class of a certain um, data point is. But what if we have maybe data looking like this, you can't really draw a line anywhere to separate these two, two classes, right? And that's, eh? Yeah? Yes, <laughs> not a straight line. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> when we're saying linear models, <laughs> we're talking about uh, straight lines. So. Um, so that's why people started using <coughs> these things called nonlinear model uh, models, and they all kind of do a very similar thing, just in in different ways, but they all have these decision boundaries and they try to separate this data as much as they can. Um, and this was um, for a very long time the way people thought about this problem, like you need to find the right function. You need to f so people look at the random forest and neural nets and is that the right one? And uh, 
one of the things that can can happen is that you um, so, so the straight line is sort of very um, we say it's, it's got very high bias meaning it's, it's it's it can't adapt very well like many of these nonlinear methods can adapt almost too well so you start fitting the noise in your data you t start fitting very specific data points in your tra training data, and then you're losing the actual signal that, uh, that is there that you're actually trying to detect. Um, so people thought that it's just a matter of finding the right balance between those two things and the right sort of set of parameters, and then this problem is solved. But yet there was a lot of problems we couldn't, couldn't really solve. And then, so around about 2012, um, in a competition called ImageNet, which is about recognizing objects in, in, in images, uh, a submission was made called AlexNet. And so this part here is, is very similar to what uh, we have been doing already. So this is just about taking features and finding the right decision boundaries and then making a, a classification based on it. Um, but what they, they, they did with everything else, instead of manually generating the features like we were trying to do now with bigrams and n-grams, they, they, they said, okay, let's just take the raw input, the raw image, let's have this whole thing here that is basically trying to detect what are the <coughs> useful features. So instead of generating the features, we are trying to learn what are the right features. Um, and that turned out to be work really, really well and be a really, really good idea. And that's what we now call, of course, deep learning, where the whole idea is around we want to try and generate uh, or learn how to best extract the features that we need instead of explicitly uh, defining them ourselves. And this model made uh, like a 10 percent uh, percentage points improvement on the current state of the art in machine learning, and that's, that's quite rare. Um, so for our problem, um, okay, let's start out with uh, the basic network, which is a feed-forward neural network. So this is where you have maybe a set of features, like number of bedrooms, square feet, which neighborhood you're in, you then have a, a neural network that is basically takes these features, uh, or applies some weights to them, and then outputs what the, what the price could be. So that's um, the kind of the basis of pretty much all neural networks. Uh, it, one place where it is used is in what is called word embeddings. So what we're doing in word embeddings is to say, try and predict nearby words from, uh, from, a, from a word, right? Um, so if you can predict the context um, of a word, or how likely a word is to be found in the context of another one, you're kind of learning something about the semantics of this word. So what you have is an input, which is just a, like a one-hot encoding, like we've seen before, a hidden layer, and an output layer. So this hidden layer is what we call the, the word embeddings. And it turns out this is usually a, a lower dimensional <coughs> type of structure. So you might have maybe 10,000 words in English, and you uh, have a one-hot encoding vector for each of them. But this, this um, hidden layer could be maybe 300 dimensional. So you're compressing all those 10,000 words into 300 dimensions. And that turned out to be a really good idea. Uh, and we end up with a case where, for instance, apple and banana, which often appear in the same context of each other, uh, are actually close in this, in this embedded vector space while another word like boat is, um, is much further away from the other ones. So you can kind of see it's, it's, it's sort of encoding context. So that seems 
uh, very useful for us. This is a typical example of how I, a word embedding vector could look like. This, this, this is for the world, word world, and it looks like, like, like gibberish in a sense. Um, but that is actually a lot of information that's encoded there. So we are running a little bit out of time. Uh, so, okay, just quickly, I want to just mention the idea of recurrent neural networks. So these things are, are very useful if you're dealing with um, any form of sequential data, specifically text in our case. And here we kind of, instead of just having this simple feed-forward architecture, we're saying we can, um, we can take the input from the last step, so the input from the last word, basically, and let that kind of uh, influence our current hidden state. And the hidden state is basically very much like an embedding, but it, it could be for an uh, entire, entire sentence. So you can actually have a single embedding for a whole, whole sentence. I'm just going to skip this in the interest of time. Okay, so let's get to some of the tools. And actually some code. So if you want to play out with this, I recommend using uh, Amazon. They go something called Deep Learning AMIs, Amazon Machine Images. Uh, I was quite shocked when I saw that's price. Then I realized that in, in dollars, they use commas to separate thousands. This is actually just three. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually just three dollars an hour, not three thousand dollars an hour. So that's <laughs> um, I definitely recommend using that. You can. Uh, SSH into this this thing, and then it gives you a whole bunch of options. All of this is just ready prepackaged for you, uh, and you can choose which which deep learning frameworks you want to work with: uh, TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch are the most popular at the moment. But and so if you and you. You can run these different commands to activate the different environments. So this is using the Conda package. So if you run source activate TensorFlow uh, P36, you get a Python 3.6 environment with TensorFlow already installed, like that. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you the two ways to deal with the named entity, entity recognition problem. The one is if you implement it for, from scratch yourself which looks a little bit um, crazy, but uh, what we've done is to basically build out a model. The model is, so this is not my work, it's a, it's a GitHub project you can go and check out um, by this, this guy. Um, but he's basically wrapped. He's using a, a framework called Keras. So people ask if I'm related to this in some way because of my name, but uh, I'm not. I don't have anything to do with it. But uh, this thing is basically like it's like building Lego for for machine learning model. You can take different things, different aspects, and combine. So in 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 the model that is currently sort of the state of the art of this problem. Um, it looks like this. It looks like a little bit crazy, but it's actually not that bad. So this is a uh, this kind of three things <laughs> coming together here. So you have the first is the word embedding layer. So that's exactly like we looked at. It's just a word embedding lookup. Then you have a casing input. So when we do word embeddings, you kind of throw away all the uppercase and lowercase and things that we said were very important. So we actually want to retain that. So you have one layer here that's actually just saying, is this a capitalized word, is, does it contain a capital letter, a few of those things. And then the third one is actually like a character level 
uh, embedding, and that will allow us to capture things, things like Xbox, XP, just those two, two vectors. And then it's actually just concatenating them, and it's you're using that recurrent neural network, uh, word for word, which is also what helps us learn the context. So if it says Apple um, has published, released this new operating system because there's an operating system in that sentence, that will actually feed through the recurrent neural network and help us uh, infer what, what if, if, if Apple is then a named entity or not. Um, and if you run this notebook, you get uh, about a 90, 90%, it's called an F1 score. It's basically a way to measure how well your, your model is, is doing. Um, but there's actually an easier way to do it than that. Uh, so you can, you can use NLTK. Don't use NLTK, uh, please. Rather use Spacey. It's a very nice. So these guys have gone and trained these models on large data sets and have tuned them, and it's, it's working really well. But for us, we can easily just use it. So you just import Spacey. Uh, you say, I want English, English language. And you take a document, like this sentence here. Um, you, uh, you run through the, the spacey uh, model. And out you get uh, named entities, person, date, organization, things. And that just works, and it's as easy as that. Uh, but if you, if you really want to do it yourself, you can obviously look at, at the other net notebooks also. Cool, thanks. I think our time is up. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, so I'm pretty sure everyone's got a whole lot of, a lot of questions. Um, hands up. Hi. Uh, so as a data scientist at Overzen, what do you actually do? So uh, our, core, <laughs> our core problem is uh, what's called recommendation engine. So we're trying to match the right candidates with the right jobs. Yeah. So if you're a Python developers and you, developer and you know things like Django and uh, Flask and a few other frameworks and you have a company that is actually looking for a person like that. We must try and infer that, the, first of all, the first company is looking for someone with those skills, and then we try and match you. So when you log into the, the Office and interface, you're going to see a list of candidates, but there's like hundreds of candidates. Uh, too many to really go through all of them, so we want to show you the most relevant ones first. So that's the, yeah. so that's the core, core problem we're working on, but I'm involved with a lot of other things around, around marketing and lead generation, and a lot of things like that. Cool. Next question. So which are, which are the frameworks are your favorite? I saw you mentioned Keras and TensorFlow. I know that they're sort of somewhat ASIC, A connected to each other in terms of what they do. Yeah, so, so Keras is more of your, your high level interface that is easy to, 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 to sort of work in. TensorFlow itself is a lot more low level, so I wouldn't recommend it, but Keras uses then TensorFlow on the back end as its engine, but it can switch that out. So it can also work with, uh, for instance, Theano, which, which isn't actively developed anymore, but um, yeah, so but as I said, like, TensorFlow is very popular, and uh, PyTorch is the other one that's, that's really, really popular for that. So um, obviously these techniques rely a lot on the quality of the data and like, having very large data sets uh, yes. in order to get very accurate. Um, do you find that most of the data sets that, that are out there in the wild are just as useful for producing like, um, production grade, um, let's say, recommendations? Or do you have to constantly, um, if, you're, if you're running a production system, do you guys feed that back in and, and sort of, um, develop your, your models a bit better? So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see if, if you can just take uh, a random um, 
data science tutorial, for example, and, and the basic kits? Yeah. And will that be production ready if, if, you, if you try to use those models there? Um, I mean, production ready is, is hard to define. So uh, that's why we measure. So, so you s in this case, we got like a 90% 90, 90 accuracy, you can say, which is, I mean, this is almost state of the art that you're getting on this particular problem, which is a very hard problem. So that's obviously very, very good, but it took a lot of research and, and work to, to get there. Um, I mean, you have other problems. Like if you could predict, uh, say, the movements of the stock market with a 51% accuracy, it's slightly better than random, say, if it's going to go up or down tomorrow, you'd be very, very rich because that's... So, uh, so it depends on your use case. Like, uh, if it's a medical application, people's lives are at stake, you probably want to be very accurate because before you put it into production. Uh, I mean, with our recommendations, if you get a bad recommendation, you might be a little bit disappointed, but that's all the damage that has really been done. The, the sort of threshold is, is a lot lower for what is acceptable performance. So. So I wanted to ask, how do you use these models for... Sorry, can you put... Okay. How do you use any of these models uh, for a data set that is not in the English language? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> if they follow similar capitalization rules and so on, then... Uh, I would ex assume it would work very well. It's not, it's not really language specific, but there are things like the, the casing feature that, that is obviously introduced because it is useful in that context. Um, if you have something like Chinese or Japanese or, or languages like that, that's, I believe that is, that is quite hard, um, but I'm not an expert in <laughs> all different sort of multilingual uh, methods, so, I mean, people are <coughs> um, What do you think is Python's likelihood of survival in, in this area? Because other <coughs> languages are popping up which are dedicated to data science and are perhaps faster than Python. Um, I don't think, I don't think that's, if, if you look at this, the Python scientific tool, sort of ecosystem. It was always a whole myriad of languages from a lot of the code running underneath even these methods are old Fortran code because the best way to multiply two matrices were discovered in the 60s and somebody wrote a, a Fortran code to do that and that's still what's being used. So um, Python is mostly just used as the language that you use to interface, interface with those things. Uh, and all of these frameworks, although, although none of them are underlying for performance reasons, not, not written in Python, all of them have Python as the primary interface language to actually define the models and to train the models and to feed the data. Uh, plus, Python has a lot of excellent tools for data preparation and, and string tools and things around that, so I'm not concerned at all. If anything, it's, it's going to go from strength to strength. Cool. Um, just one last question. What is the accuracy you're getting from your machine learning models in your environment? Um, so we had uh, the, the way are uh, we talking about the recommendation or the ranking of the, the candidates now. So when I started with that, we uh, had more like a more more of a random type of list that were produced just by the latest candidates that were, that were on the platform and the metric I used is one that kind of you can interpret it as in, in, in the, say the top first top 10 how likely are you to, to find every candidates that, that's relevant to you that you want to reach out to and when we started we had about 1 in 10 um, uh, as the metric and then we did one iteration of the machine learning we had about 1 in 5 and then we did another one, one in three. So that means that if you, if you log in <laughs> as a user to the system, about every third candidate will be somebody you, you want to reach out to. So that's, that's the cool. metric there. Thank you very much. Um, you. Next session is going to be starting in two minutes. <laughs>
Thank you.